where we are tonight is we're talking about the return and the reign of Jesus. Amen? And where we ended last time in chapter 18, if you'll remember, well, one, one of the things I wanted to talk about, though, when I said this, was this. And I've been, this is what I've been talking to people about the last couple of days. God's been opening up doors. God does everything out in the open. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? All, God shines light. The gospel is light. And everything that God does is shines out in the open. He called Abraham out. You can still see about Israel on CNN. Jesus, this thing wasn't done in a corner somewhere. The, uh, Peter, the apostle Peter said, we don't tell you about cunningly devised fables. We're not telling you about something that we heard about. We saw it. We saw him transfigured before our very eyes. So, so what I need you to know is, is that God does everything in the light. But what the enemy does, and, and, I, and I tried to show you that, that's why it's called Mystery Babylon. I can't really draw it on the board to make it look subtle, but it's a parallel course. A parallel course that the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, the devil, Satan himself, has been running a parallel course yes. under the radar yes. along the same time that God has through the Holy Spirit through Israel, through the church, calling people to come to him, the spirit of Antichrist has been running a parallel course through the world system, through the governments, yeah. through, through the through entertainment industry, yeah. through, through the financial industry, and, and any way that he can sink his claws into anything, he offers people power, prestige, and if they're willing to buy into it, he will use them as vessels to accomplish his will upon the earth. We're going to get into that and try to bring it home a little bit here in a second. But I wanted you to see that, that since the fall, and there's been a movement really towards a new world order to try, since the Tower of Babel, yep. Yep. whenever the languages were confused, since that time, the enemy has tried to corporately bring mankind back under a one world system. And, you know, but, but where we were last week was, is that God destroyed the, the harlot, which is a seven headed beast from which the Antichrist comes and represents corrupt governments. I'm going to try to keep it simple. If you've been with us for a while, you know what I'm talking about. So it represents corrupt governments. And there was a harlot riding the beast. And she represents false religion. Every false religion you've ever known. I was telling that preacher that this morning. It's Buddhism. It's, it's not just Buddhism. It's, it's Sufism, which is a form of Islam. It's, um, it's Hinduism. It's, I'm not supposed to say it, huh? It's Catholicism. I'm going to say it. Why are you going to say it, preacher? Why are you so mad at everyone? I'm not mad. I'm mad at the devil. That's right. Because he's a liar and a deceiver. I was telling that preacher this morning, I said, dude, that little Jewish girl, that, that, ain't, that ain't her that's holding that baby like that. You go around the whole world, and we're about to get into this when we teach a cult exposure, mother-child deities in every culture. When the Jesuit priests went over there to bring their lives over to China, and they saw a mother-child deity over there, they were blown away. How in the world did he get there? Because the serpent was told that the seed of the woman would crush his head before there was a flood, before there was a confusion of the languages. The serpent already knew it. The people already knew it. They heard the proclamation. And as the people group spread across the globe, they brought that part of the story with them. And the lie has stayed the same. And you see it in South America. You see it in Greece. You see it in Rome. You see it in the Middle East. And you see it in, in, in Asia. It's all over the place. That, that's physical signs that something's going on, folks. Yes. And I'm telling you that our eyes have been closed to it. And that's why I say it out loud, so that we can hear it. But it's not only all that, it's Protestantism. Yep. Did you hear what I said? It's Protestantism. Mm -hmm. The seeker-sensitive movement, contemplative prayer, taking Eastern mysticism and bringing that into the church. And the teachers of this stuff are people like Beth Moore, 
who some churches take her stuff and recycle it, and she refused to back away from the whole contemplative prayer thing. It's a, it's a form of meditation that empties the mind. Why are you even talking about all this? Because it's the spirit of Antichrist. It's mystery Babylon. It's running a parallel course and it's deceiving people. Oh, you think you're the only one that's got it right? Of course not. I'm a human being. I can't get it right all the time. But what we're doing is we're going back to the Word of God. Amen? And we're going to learn the Word of God. And we're not going to... You get the point I'm trying to make. Where we were last time at the end of chapter 17, the, the, the harlot and, and the government system was destroyed. And, and financial Babylon was destroyed in chapter 18. And it said the kings of the earth wailed. The inhabitants of the earth wailed. You know, when you can't get your stuff anymore all of a sudden in one day, it isn't too cool. You understand what I'm saying? When you had something that you wanted and you had to give, you was able to get it as much as you wanted it, and now all of a sudden it's dry. That's what they used to call it back in the old days. The town's dry. And when it's dry like that, people start crying and they start wailing and things aren't going the way that they wanted to go. Whenever chapter 18 rolled around, financial Babylon came to a halt. And they wasn't getting what they wanted no more. And the kings of the earth started to cry because they had been committing fornication with it. But just as the kings of the earth in chapter 18 were crying in chapter 19, look at this in the first two verses. Chapter Revelation 19, chapters one, I mean verses 1 and 2. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants. So let's just slow down a little bit. I didn't plan on doing all this, but what is all that talk? What is he, what is he talking about? You know, the, the whore, the fornication. This is all talking about spirituality. You understand that? A false religion that would cause mankind to be moved away from the truth and to commit adultery against God by engaging in a relationship with a false religious system. And, and the result of it is that it corrupted the entirety of the earth. And God allowed it to go on for a period of time. But now we're at the end and he's not allowing it anymore. And it's all going to be exposed and it's all going to be judged. As I was, as I was you know, studying through some of these things, one, one little smart aleck put on there, the millennial reign of Christ. Keep on waiting because it will never happen. You know, because they're atheists and they, and they don't believe and they think we're fools. No, sir, I'm telling you, there's coming a day. I might not see it. I don't know. But I'm telling you right now, the word of God will stand strong and it will, it will be fulfilled and the Lord will physically rule and reign upon this earth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But, but God is going to avenge the atrocities that have happened upon this earth. That word hallelujah, I thought this was interesting. It's the Hebrew version of hallelujah and it simply means praise the Lord. So while the inhabitants of the earth were frustrated because their stuff got taken away from them. And the judgment was falling upon financial Babylon. The people of God are rejoicing. And they're saying, praise the Lord. God, God showed up. Remember how we used to, I remember a few weeks ago, I told you we needed to be praying. Lord, your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus told us to do. What he meant was, was that the, usur the liar usurped Adam's authority. And he has some dominion upon this earth. And that, and that Jesus is saying, you need to pray that God's will in heaven would ultimately be done on earth. And whenever that happens, that means that the Prince of Peace is coming back and he's going to rule and reign on a throne in Jerusalem. And then God's will for this earth is going to be done just as it is in heaven. But in the meantime, we're, you may think that everything's good in America. You, you may think everything's hunky-dory. I don't know. Maybe you're just living the life. I don't, I, you know, but the truth, and I know it could be worse than a lot of other places. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm trying to say is don't be fooled by the little bit of freedom that we think we have that everything's fine. Because it's not. There's a, there's a spirit of deception that's, that's on the land. And so this is a scripture. We're about to go to it. But one of the scriptures I wanted to talk to you about it here in a second talks about the fact that 
Jesus said, I'm going to judge the, the prince of this earth. The prince of this earth is going to be judged. And he was talking about the fact that he was about to go to the cross. Spiritually speaking, you see, I got a picture here of the enemy having the earth, if you will, in a death hold, in a death grip. But Jesus, see right here, we're reading about a judgment on this, by this system that's going to be physical in the end. But 2,000 years before our time now, Jesus on the cross did something in the spiritual realm that completely changed things. See, that's whenever, whenever we're talking about the cross and people tell you, oh man, we got to move past the cross. No, we're not talking about two pieces of wood. Amen. Amen. We're talking about a spiritual victory that was accomplished yes. when Jesus died and paid the debt of sin. Yes. Like the sister said, he had no sin. The wages of sin is death, but he had no sin, so he paid the penalty of sin. That's why he came resurrecting out the grave. Amen. And when you put your faith in that, the power of sin over your life is supposed to be broken. And as you, and let's open it, but you told me that last week, preacher, good. Keep on holding on. Keep on trusting in Christ. Yeah. Keep on believing that what he did for you at the cross was enough. Hold on to him, child of God. Don't let go. And I'm telling you, you will see the victory of the Lord manifest on the inside of your life. Amen. So Jesus did something spiritually and judged the work of the enemy when he went to the cross. I want, you, I want to actually turn to a couple of these scriptures real quick. Because we're still talking about, to some extent, this mystery Babylon, this parallel course that's, that's been going on. I, I just... I don't know. That, I, I guess that was the main emphasis that was in my mind as I was writing this. And John 12, 31. If you don't have a Bible, we always keep Bibles in the back. It's just easier to read. We're going to study the Bible. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. So once again, in the end, we're seeing right now what we're reading in Revelation 19 is a physical judgment. But Jesus said when he was about to go to the cross, that's what he's talking about. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Well, some people would say, well, the cross didn't work too well then because he's not gone. No, but the Lord will give you victory in your personal life. You understand Amen. what I'm saying? Amen. When you put your faith in Christ and you get translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, listen to me, you'll never be the same. I'm telling Amen. you right now, Amen. you are never going to be perfect, but you will never be the same. The Holy Spirit living and ruling and reigning on the inside of you is going to change some things. And it Amen. gave you the opportunity in the spiritual realm to be pulled out of darkness into light. So that's what Jesus did when he judged the prince of this world. I, I want you to hold on to the thought of world right there because we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I also want to go to 1 John chapter 2. Because you see, I want you to remember that the people of God in Revelation 19 are excited. They're happy. They're, they're cheering. Remember I said that in Revelation 18, the people of the world were upset. In Revelation 19, the people of God are excited. And I wanted you to see this passage of Scripture in 1 John 2.15. It says, 1 John 2, verse 15, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Mm -hmm. So you remember that last verse had the word world in it. Hold on to that thought because this verse has the word world in it. We're going to come back to that in a second, all right? But it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, what does that mean? What is your, what is it? The lust is a craving for your, for your flesh. Your, your physical body wants something and you're craving it. It's not of the father. It says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. You see something you want. It looks good. I want it. I want to take it. It's not of the father. Uh, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I hate to admit it, but I think I've been this way ever since I was a little kid. Yeah. Now you could, I remember one time my dad, my daddy bought me a coat from Kmart, and 
It had fleece, li fleece lining. Oh, Lord, help me. Because maybe you got a coat like that. You like it. It had fleece lining in it. And he told me, man, I, I got you this coat. And, and, and this coat will keep you warm, boys. It'll keep your core warm. You hear me? And I said, and I, and I didn't know what to say. I'd be honest with you because I didn't want to get rile him up. And I can remember my little sister said, oh, no, Daddy, we don't shop at Kmart. <laughs> and he listened to her, so I just sat in the back and let it roll that way. And you know what? I think I, from that, not, not blaming it on you, but from that day forward, I've been real concerned about the way things look. It's called the pride of life. Now, at the same time, the Lord's knocked me down a whole bunch, you know, and, and, and told me that I don't have to try to drive the best thing. And, I, you know, you understand what I'm getting at? I don't have to get caught up in all that cares of the world. Now, I mean, it's still in me to some extent. Lord, kill it. It's not supposed to be there. But, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. Pride of life. <laughs> love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Just remember that. I want, to, I want to remind you about the thing. See, because you can't rejoice with the believers in Revelation 19 that financial Babylon has been destroyed if you love the world right. and the things of the world. You can't rejoice that, that God has destroyed the world system. You understand what I'm getting at? All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. <coughs> Let's start at verse 1. It says, And you has he quickened. Ephesians 2, verse 1, says, And you has he quickened. What does that word quickened mean? In alive. King, alive. That's right. That's old King James English for meaning alive. He made you alive. You has he quickened, made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So how, why were you dead in trespasses and sin? Because you were born like your daddy Adam. Mm -hmm. Way back over there. You were born like your daddy Adam. The first birth, you were born like Adam, born in sin. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You didn't even know God. Oh, you might have heard the name Jesus. But in, listen, let's get this straight, just in case you walked in here tonight and you're not born again. If you are not a born again Christian, then you don't know God. That, that's not, I know that sometimes my, my personality, I've been told that sometimes I come across the wrong way. People that really know me, they say, dude, you're not, you're not really arrogant. I don't think you are, but sometimes you come across that way. I'm sorry if I come across that way. That's not what I'm trying to do right now. But if you happen to walk in here tonight and you're not a born again Christian, you do not know God. You can't know him until you've been born from the dead. Praise God. And the only way, the, it's not real hard to be born from the dead. God had a plan. Called a man named Abraham, created a nation called Israel, gave us Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Now people are looking backwards at Christ and what he did at the cross. And they're not just believing cognitively or intellectually, but they're giving their heart to what Christ has done. Them. Came to the realization that I was a sinner. I needed a savior. And I invited Jesus into my heart. And I said, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. And when I did that, a miracle happened. Amen. The Holy Spirit Praise moved God. in. Amen. And you won't ever be the same. Praise Amen. Jesus. And so that's what it means right there in chapter 2, verse 1. And you has he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. There's that word world again. Did you ever walk the course of the world? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you travel down that sidewalk a time or two? Mm -hmm. Course of the world according to the prince of the power of the air. See, that same prince is the same person we're talking about when we talk about Mystery Babylon. It's the same system we're talking about when we talk about the, the whore of the, the harlot. When we talk about the beast and the seven-headed kingdom. All of this is intertwined and interconnected because it's the spirit of Antichrist that's moving this whole thing forward. Once again, I want you to know that just as the Holy Spirit is moving mankind towards God, the spirit of Antichrist, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience oh, yeah. is moving upon the face of the earth 
and moving humanity in a certain direction. <clears throat> Some people would say, well, I don't have the problems you have, preacher, or you used to have. Well, if you're all caught up in the world system and what you're so worried about what you're going to drive, and you're so worried about what your clothes, and you're so worried about how you look, come on. Then, then the truth of the matter is, is that you may be being driven a little bit more than what you really like to like to realize. I'm just saying, I mean, I'm preaching to myself. We, we need to all come to that realization. I, I know, I know. I remember one time some dude told me, he said, man, the Lord got a hold of me. And I was thinking to myself, what about clothes? Clothes? Why are we so caught up in clothes? We get so caught up in clothes and the style of them and the brand names. He's like, what about Jesus? Yeah. What about letting Jesus do something to my heart? I don't know why I'm here, but anyway, I was. But <laughs> the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air, moving the children of disobedience in a certain direction. Now, this is what I, I put this on here. Because I'm trying to I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you a picture. I, I would have never put this up here. But this is what happened. Now, you're not going to believe this. Yesterday, so I'm, I'm over here, you know, thinking about my message. And I walk into a room, and there's this little girl, about four years old. And she's just the smartest little thing. And she starts reciting. Sophia couldn't find her amulet. And she needs to find her amulet so that she can talk to the animals. And she's just sitting there talking, you know, about Sophia and the amulet. And she, how Sophia wants to talk to the animals. Well, the crazy thing is, is that I know what an amulet is. I know who Sophia is. I mean, I don't know who this Sophia is, but I know who the Greek goddess Sophia is. Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, who goes back to the story of the Tower of Babel, who goes back to Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, who goes back to Mystery Babylon, an amulet. Well, what's an amulet? Well, let's read it. It says, and I got this off of a witchcraft website, by the way. All right. Amulets are objects imbued with magical properties, and the amulet can be used as a protection against evil or misfortune. They are among the most powerful protectors. The ancient civilizations believed in amulets, and witches wear them as a necklace, carry one with them, and have amulets in their home. Amulets are made from a variety of materials and fashioned into various shapes. One is necklaces, rings, or bracelets. Some have inscriptions carved into them. Others have precious or semi-precious gems. The amulets are then imbued with magical powers of protection, usually through chanting and spells. Does everybody that's got Sophia in there on their book sack worshiping the goddess of wisdom from Greece? Well, of course not. But the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit that works in the children of disobedience is starting them out real young. Yes. To where this girl's quoting amulets. One of the things that it hit me this morning when I started thinking about this was she wasn't talking about Jesus. That's right. She wasn't talking about Jesus. She was talking about Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, or whoever this little chick is, and <laughs> amulets. But she wasn't talking about Jesus. <laughs> Done took Jesus right out of her mouth. And then today I saw three different kids walk up in the clinic with Sophia on their back. I wasn't even sure that this could be reality. I'm like, who is that girl on your back? Sophia. And she's everywhere. <laughs> Maybe I just didn't notice her before. But it, it, we think it's funny, but it's really kind of sad because, see, they start you off with Sophia. And then when you're a little bit older, they get you to read Harry Potter. Yep. And then when you get a little bit older, you get into the, the, the vampire stories. Come on, it's yep. all occultic, it's all dark. Oh, yes. don't tell me it's okay. That's right. If you, well, I'm not going to get too rude. But. <laughs> and then and, and, and it's just one thing leads to the other. Everything on TV nowadays is so dark and so occultic. Yes. And people are people driven it. towards it. They're oh, enticed yeah. by it. Yes. Uh, and, and it's like the spirit of Antichrist just has the whole world under a spell. Like all this stuff's cool and everything's okay. Oh, this is uh, this is definitely PG-13. <laughs> you can't even see the whole thing, so I guess I won't read the, the last line. There's one. I, I looked up some lyrics. I just, I don't, I'm, I'm a nerd. I don't know anything about dance music, nothing like that. I just Googled what is the number one dance song or club song or whatever. Now, and this may not even be it because, you know, you start talking to really cool people and they're like, dude, that's not the number one song or okay, or whatever. I'm not that cool. I'm just telling you, what I Googled, 
This is what came up. Whirly girl, y'all ever heard of that person? I don't know who that is. Say it. No, I don't, I don't, I don't listen to it. I didn't listen to it. I just got the lyrics. Whirly girl, and the name of the song is OXO. And so I just wanted you to see, this is her story. She's been to Paris, France. She can dance. It says uh, she's a straight shooter. It says that um, she's been with the Rolling Stones on their tours and in their homes. And the, of course I messed it up because I made it too big and you can't read it. But the very last line says this, because she ain't lost and don't want to be found. All right. So that, that's, that's that one, one thing there. Once again, she's been to France. The girl just combs her hair and takes her tea with millionaires. And then you can see some of that other stuff she says that they say about her down there at the bottom. That's how she ended up in the Rolling Stones home. But, but the point is, is this, is that this is the spirit of Antichrist that's working on the world system. And I don't mean to be ugly, but we have a hard enough time, even with the grace of God moving and operating in our lives, from not filling ourselves with this kind of garbage. And I mean, this is pretty mild compared to some of the stuff that I've heard that's out there. And yet, at the same time, people that call themselves Christians filling themselves up with this stuff. Yes. And I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. And I know I've really belabored the point about the spirit of Antichrist and how it's working on the world and is driving humanity in a certain direction. And I hope that I've gotten my point across to help you to be able to see some of the some of the things that are going on. We're going back to the concept of the world. Let's read this other passage real quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. Verses 40 through 42. First gospel. Matthew 13. 40 through 42. Now the first scripture we already read. John 12, 31. That was where it says that he was going to judge the world. And that the prince of the earth the prince of this world was going to be cast out. And it says in verses 40 through 42 of Matthew chapter 13, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. Y'all remember this story? It's the parable of the tares and the wheat. The whole story, from what I remember, I didn't read it this morning, but the whole story goes that there was a man that owned a, a land, land and they sowed good seed. And so God owns the earth and he sowed good seed in the earth. The word of God is good seed. Amen. The people of God are supposed to be good seed. Amen? Amen. And then the workmen fell asleep. Specifically, he's talking about Israel in the parable. But don't think that the church can't fall asleep too. Yeah. The good men fell asleep. And whenever that happened, an enemy came. Talking about Satan. And he sowed tares amongst the wheat. Now, tares are a weed and they're poisonous. And they grow up and they look just like wheat. But at some point you can tell the difference between the two. And whenever the workers woke up and they saw the tares amongst the wheat, they said, oh, what are we going to do? Should we go and the Lord, the master of the, he said, no, you don't pull them up yet. Because if you do that, then you're going to destroy the wheat. He said in the end, at the harvest, then we'll take care of it. And this is the end of that parable. It says, Jesus explains it to them. So therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out his kingdom of all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So we're talking about the world system. We're talking about the enemy and uh, specifically this word world was used in two different places and it's two different Greek words. And I just got the definition here. You don't have, we're not asking you to memorize it. I'm just trying to explain it to you. Whenever Jesus said that he was going to judge the world through the cross, what it's talking about is the word cosmos is describing in that context the whole ungodly multitude of mankind that refuses to come to God. Okay? And that are contrary to the plan of God. But then there's this other word that we just read here, eon. It's where we get the idea of, and, and this is from the English dictionary below it, an indefinitely long period of time. So both the world is representative of the inhabitants of the world. And in this context, those that are not serving God and are going to come under the judgment of God. But it also represents a specific time frame, a time frame from here to there. 
of ungodliness that has fallen upon the earth. And in the end, Jesus is going to separate it all out and judgment is going to take place. And then let's go ahead and go to Revelation 19, 13. So this is where, it kind of, where, where the action kind of shifts because what we see now is that Jesus is coming back. We're talking about how the earth is going to be judged. And now we're talking about the return of Jesus. You know, many times we've talked about it in the Bible study or in, this, in church services here. How the first time Jesus came, how, what was he riding? A donkey. That's right. He was lowly and riding a donkey. But the second time when he comes, he's going to be riding a white stallion is what it says. The first time he came as a, a humble and lowly savior. The second time he's going to come as a judge. And it says in Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. I wrote down a little note for myself to remind me that because it also says in verse 14, verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. I wrote a little note for myself to remind me that he created this earth. This world and this earth is his. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking last night, I think it was, about some of the people that I've tried to witness to. And, 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 and the attitude that the world has. How dare you force Christianity on somebody? How dare you talk about Jesus in public? But what they don't understand is, is that this whole earth belongs to him. Yes. He spoke it into existence with, his, with He is the word of God before he was in the flesh, in his physical flesh. He spoke the world into existence. And not only did he speak it into existence, but he redeemed it through the blood that he shed on the cross. And now in this passage of scripture, he's coming back to retake it. And it says in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. <clears throat> It goes on to say his eyes are as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture, which means a garment, dipped in blood. See the, in the picture you can see how it's, how it's red. Clothed in a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And look at verse, for, verse 14 if you turn there. It says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and clean. Now, I just want you to know that I, did, I just noticed it really for the first time for myself this morning when I was looking at it. The reason that they're able to wear white garments is because he's wearing a red garment. Amen. It's because of the shedding of his blood. Amen. Amen. Once again, another picture of the cross. You can't get past it. Right. It's the whole gospel story. It's the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. He's the one that makes us righteous. Amen? Amen. It goes on to say that he's going to judge the nations in verse 15. But we're going to go ahead and move on. Let's, go, let's skip down to verse 19. In Revelation 19, this is somebody that ended up in the lake of fire. And he is not happy about it in case you can't tell. Verse 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now you remember who the beast is, right? Mm -hmm. The beast is the Antichrist. And he came from that seven-headed beast, which represented seven different kingdoms and his kingdom. But this right here is talking specifically that the beast is a person who is the Antichrist, who Satan will possess in the end days. And Last week we talked about how the, the demon spirits were enticing all of these nations to come together to Armageddon. And that's basically what we're seeing about to happen here. That Jesus destroys them with the sword of his mouth. But it says, and, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet, and that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them. That had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with his flesh. Now I'm going to try to teach some kind of deep stuff real quick. 
But um, that's kind of what we do here. And if you feel like you get lost, then it's okay. It'd be, that's what we, we, we teach the Bible. And just because you don't understand it all the first time, I keep trying to tell, remind people that the first time you sat down and tried to learn what X, I don't even know algebra enough to even try this, but how does X equal 2? I don't know, but I know there's probably a 4 involved in there somewhere. But my point is, is that the first time somebody tried to tell me that, my brain couldn't wrap around it. I made one C in college and it was intrigued. I was not that good in math. You get the point I'm trying to make. You got to learn stuff. Is it okay for us to learn? Amen. So don't get frustrated. And be like, man, that preacher's talking about stuff I've never heard before. Look, that's good. We're learning. Amen. We're being challenged. All right. The beast and the false prophet. I thought that, I, I guess that, that that one picture right there looks a little bit silly. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that I'm trying to show you the longevity of the plan of the enemy too. And I told you last week, I used this picture of the Pope and Hitler to describe, I'm not trying to say that that's what it will be, but the Antichrist is a world leader and the false prophet, that's the beast and the false prophet that were thrown into the lake of fire. I believe it's going to be some type of a connection like that. A world leader along with some type of a false prophet, some type of a religious leader. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, in this other picture, I, that's just a picture of Merlin and some king or a warlock. The idea is the same thing. This stuff's been going on. Counterfeits taking place throughout the ages where government has been in conjunction with the, the harlot of Babylon with this false religious system with the occult. And anyway, I just wanted you to know that that's who's thrown into the lake of fire. Now, what is the lake of fire? I don't know if you can see these maps too well, but this, this down here, you can't see the words, I know. It says the valley of the son of Hinnom. This is Jerusalem, and south of Jerusalem there was a valley called the valley of Hinnom. You can see this picture a little bit better, the, the Hinnom Valley. And this is a picture of the modern day valley of Hinnom, which is a literal place that existed during the time frame of ancient Israel, but also during the time frame of Jesus. And when Jesus said that there's going to be a place where the worm doesn't die and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, he was talking about this place. It, 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 he used this as an example. It's called Gehenna. All right. So there was a literal valley called Gehenna. Now, that's why the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that there's a literal hell because they think he was just talking about that valley. But it was obvious. All you got to do is put your thinking cap on and realize that Jesus is talking about eternal judgment. That's another story. But basically, that's what the Valley of Hinnom was. It, it was a refuse valley. They threw carcasses from animals in there. They threw all of the trash in there. And it constantly was burning. And it was constantly the smell of burning flesh. And about and worm, you know, worms in the animals. And that's the picture that Jesus is giving, but he's using it as an illustration to describe what eternal judgment's going to be like. And so the beast and the false prophet in the end are thrown in this <coughs> spiritual Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. Now, one of the interesting things about, about the valley of Hinnom or Gehenna was that there was a horrible situation that took place where Israel, this is this is the god Molech. And they would offer their own children up. Yeah. Now, this was a Canaanite god. Canaan is the area where Israel is before it was Israel. They were supposed to run these inhabitants of the land off. And Israel didn't get rid of them all. And there was a time frame where Israel set this statue up in the Valley of Hinnom. And they offered their own children as human sacrifice. To them, So you can see the horrid picture of what this Gehenna thing is all about. I'm just giving you some history. All right. So they were thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is, now we're moving on to chapter 20, verse 1. And it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, I'm not going to really turn there, but I got two different pictures here. And in this picture here, I, he's supposed to have it. He's supposed to have a key in his hand. You can't really see it. But that's Satan with a key in his hand. And then this is an angel. And he's got a key too. And he's got a chain. And I just want to remind you. Remember, in, was, it, was it Revelation 9? Whenever, um, whenever there was an, a star that fell from heaven. And to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Remember that? And we talked about the, the star that fell from heaven was Satan. 
And he was given a key to the bottomless pit. And remember when he unlocked it, what happened? All the demon spirits came out. And that angel, Apollyon, came out. Well, I just want you to notice the difference. In that passage of scripture, it said a star fell from heaven and was given a key. In this passage of scripture, it says an angel came down with a key. This, the last time the, the, the bottomless pit was unlocked to let the demon spirits and fallen angels out, this time this angel is going to chain up Satan and bind him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Then it says after a thousand years, and now during this thousand years, this is what you call the, the, the millennial reign of Christ. I would write it, but I'll probably spell it wrong. And I hate spelling things wrong, but the millennial <coughs> reign. Thousand years. So for a thousand years, Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem on a throne. That's what the word of God says. <coughs> He's going to be the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the David covenant, the covenant that God promised that there would be an eternal king on David's throne. Jesus' lineage comes from the house of David. And so that's going to be the fulfillment. Jesus is going to rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. Then it says, I'm, I'm speeding up because I'm, I'm ready to, I want to close. Then it says after the thousand years is up, Satan's going to be loosed for a short period of time. Before he... Go, gets thrown into Gehenna or the lake of fire. So I just, I just got a question for you. What, what, would you. what would you propose or what would you think would be the reason to let Satan out of the bottomless pit for a short period of time after this thousand year reign? But while you're thinking about that, let me just tell you, out of Isaiah 11... <clears throat> this is some of the stuff that it says is going to happen during that thousand years. Out of Isaiah 11, it says that a wolf and a lamb will lie together. It says that a leopard and a goat will lie together. It says that a child will put its hand on a viper's hole and not be harmed. Because the knowledge of the Lord will be over the entirety of the earth. See, even though we can't see this right now. You and I both know that it's there. You and I both know that it's there because it's tried to grip a hold of us and it's tried to drive us in every direction the opposite of God. And we can, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. We know it's there because it drives mankind in an opposite direction. And I just want you to imagine the script completely flipped to where it's no longer the spirit that works in the children of disobedience that's ruling and reigning upon the earth. But instead, see right now the Holy Spirit is ruling and reigning in your is, is supposed to be ruling and reigning in your life, is supposed to be ruling and reigning in my life, because the kingdom of God is resident in us. Amen. But there's coming a day when the kingdom of God is going to be resident upon the physical earth. And during that time frame, the Holy Spirit is going to be the spirit that's ruling and reigning and driving mankind rather than the spirit of disobedience driving mankind in the wrong direction. And so the knowledge of the Lord is going to fill the earth. And so that's why a wolf and a lamb will be able to lie together. That's why a leopard and a goat will be able to lie together. That's why a child will be able to put its hand on a viper's hole and not get bit. So, but my question to you is this, is that why after a thousand years would Satan be loosed from that bottomless pit? Gather his followers. Gather his followers. Well, that's a good people question. Because people will still be born. People are still going to be born. And so, they got, then they got to make a choice. So the point is, is this, if we think it through, just to, you know, because everybody may not be thinking on the same page, because everything, everything that everybody said was right. But, <clears throat> so what happens is, is that when the rapture of the church took place, the bride of Christ, those of us who know him today, we're taken and we, we went up in a resurrection like he did. And just as he received a glorified body, we receive a glorified body. Word of God says in the, in, in the book of Matthew that, that when we be, receive a glorified body, that we're like the angels of God in heaven and that we're not given in marriage. In other words, we don't engage in that type of thing anymore. We have a glorified body. And I can assure you it's going to be better than what you're experiencing now. It's got to be. God's not going to take something away that, you know, that you enjoyed that, that, was, that he created and not give you something better. Amen? But you're going to have a glorified body. Amen? 
and you won't be procreated. But there will be people that were left on the earth that didn't die, that will be procreating. And they still had a sinful nature. See, that's the beautiful thing is, is that one day whenever you receive your glorified body, sin will, will finally be eradicated from you. Yes. Right now it's supposed to be dormant in you, yes. according to the word of God. But it can certainly come back alive, I can assure you that. Oh, yes. <laughs> but there's coming a day when it will be eradicated from you. But there's still going to be people on the earth who have a sinful nature who will be procreating and for a thousand years. Now, you would imagine, though, if the spirit of Jesus was ruling and reigning on the earth and knowledge of the Lord was all over the place, that it would be that, that nobody would ever turn their back on the Lord had they lived so in such close proximity to Jesus. I'm telling you, he's a deceiver. Yes, he is. And he's going to get out and he's going to cause some people to follow him again. And then finally he'll be thrown into the lake of fire where he will join the, the beast and the false prophet and he will, the smoke of his torment will rise forever and ever.